to an emerging uh, agile technique called user design studio. The technique addresses the need to rapidly design a preliminary user interface for your software product. Most agile teams use mock up their initial UI wireframes in, in, in a single day and getting the right group of people in the room that will cover, you can quickly put together uh, a, a, a good user interface to get started and essentially leverage the, the thinking behind wisdom of routes. This is a book that was written by James Rocky a few years ago. It has been a bestseller book and a very powerful topic, wisdom of routes. So we have uh, Mike Hall and introduce um, uh, Mike in a few minutes. The topic we're going to talk about user design studio by way of logistics. We would have roughly 40, 45 minutes of actual presentation here, uh, and we'll still leave 15 minutes or so to end for question answers, but uh, what I'll do is along the way, if you have any questions, you can keep sending your questions in the Q&A panel of the GoToWebinar system, and I'll keep uh, keep track of these questions. Wherever the question is such that it is better answered along the flow in uh, the content, I'll leave the question up, otherwise we'll keep the question for the, for the end. And we will indeed make the document available uh, after the webinar. You'll see a follow-up email with a link with the document we used today. With that, let me introduce um, the speaker and presenter. Uh, Mike Hall is a, is a regular presenter in this monthly webinar series. Whenever we are able to get him for the webinar, we do. Uh, Mike is the CEO and founder of uh, Citizens, uh, and he's himself a software practitioner, which is very important uh, for these webinars to have someone who really uh, is a live this day to day these challenges and and and. and speak from that perspective. He's also an Agile coach and trainer, for sure. Uh, he's been an early adopter of, of Agile practices from the year 2000, and Agile was just getting formalized uh, those years. He's also certified and he has successfully transformed uh, many uh, teams uh, to Agile methods, uh, resulting in a significant impact of that improvement. Uh, and as I said, he's a regular presenter. I'm delighted to welcome Mike, over to you, Mike. All right. Thank you, Hemeth. Um, and um, I guess I should thank you. Um, usually when Hemeth introduces me at these internship uh, webinars, he mentions that I'm a seasoned uh, software developer and agile coach. And I always kid him about that because he and I both know what that word means. It means old. So... Anyway, I uh, just had a birthday recently, so I thought I would throw that in there. <laughs> right, thanks. Okay, folks, uh, today's topic is User Design Studio. Wow, this is a great uh, Agile technique. If you're involved in any way, shape, or form in product development or user interface, you need this in your repertoire. Um, I was first exposed to this technique in, in uh, I think it was here 2008 at the Agile 2008 conference. There was a workshop tutorial by Jim Unger and Jeff White. Um, and since that time, several versions of this technique have emerged, um, you know, looking a little bit different and with using names such as Design Studio, UI Design Studio, and User Design Studio. So I've kind of coalesced all that information, put my own spin on it, a few tweaks and quangs here from my personal experience in utilizing this technique for more than 30 times. Um, and we'll be spinning through that and presenting it to you today. So, um, Okay, uh, let's see. I'm trying to figure out how to advance the slide. Um, ah, okay. All right, a little technical difficulty there. Okay, well, I always like to start the discussion of the user design studio with an analogy. And Emmett, just to check here, okay, it's showing up on yours. Very good. Well, let's start with an analogy. Um, if you can kind of understand this analogy, then it fits right into the user design studio. So the analogy is a, an art gallery showing where you are the artist and people view your art and give feedback. So perhaps you would consign with an art gallery 
to display your art, and then uh, maybe you would sneak in and listen to people as they make comments about your art. Um, and as you might expect, these comments will be both positive and constructive. And here is a great example uh, coming up on your screen right now, an art gallery showing in Bangalore, India. And this is by an, um, an artist named Dr. Norman Luis Guido. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And, you know, just looking at this uh, artwork, what would be your feedback? Um, perhaps your feedback might be that the images are very powerful and really jump off the canvas. I know when I first uh, saw a picture of this, that's the, uh, that's the definite impression I got. Another bit of feedback might be that the subjects are quite varied. Um, you know, you, you, they actually range from the religious to the sensual and to something on the lower right-hand corner that, that almost looks like the movie Avatar. Here's another example of an art gallery showing. Uh, this is actually an example of contemporary art. So perhaps your feedback on this is that it's colorful, it's soothing, it's uplifting. Or um, I did a workshop recently on this technique, and a lot of the feedback I received on this slide was, oh, I don't like it, it's ugly, it's just not my cup of tea. So you know, you would give your personal opinion about that artwork. And finally, here's um, another example of an art gallery showing in Beijing, China. Um, the Chinese artist Chen Wenling. And his artwork here is intended, it's actually a sculpture, it's intended to convey the power of Wall Street. And so perhaps your feedback might be, wow, this is really brash, it's in your face. Um, it brings up negative emotions, things like that. So uh, those are just some examples of some of the feedback that you might give uh, in terms of the art, art gallery showing analogy. Now let's introduce the user design studio, keeping the art gallery showing analogy in mind. Okay, so an overview, as Hemant uh, uh, mentioned in the introduction, uh, is, is this. Most user design studios take one day or less, and it kind of depends on the size of, of your project. The net result of this technique is a set of low fidelity wireframes written, hand drawn on paper. And I want to emphasize the use of low fidelity here. In the spirit of Agile methods, we're, we're going to do just enough to get started with. Um, and obviously the UI design will change as you execute your sprints in the spirit of emergent design and as you get more and more feedback from your clients, the user interface design will change. So here's a few examples of some low fidelity wireframes. Uh, this one is an executive dashboard user interface with two main modes. Uh, at the top is a monitor mode showing the key performance indicators in small graph form. If you're familiar with uh, dashboard type approaches, this is, this is very akin to that. At the bottom is an analysis mode, which shows a more detailed view, you know, allowing the user or executive to drill down into a specific performance indicator. And as you can see that there's a uh, there's uh, other screens for revenue trending and even alerts and warnings and things like that. Here's another example of, um, of a wireframe. Um, this represents a new social network uh, that perhaps is involved with uh, gardening because it involves roses, rosebuds, and, and uh, items like that. As you can see, it's drawn on paper. Uh, the user here chose graph paper to draw it on and, you know, shows a pen there. Pens are okay uh, during this technique. It might be better to use a pencil because you will be uh, reworking uh, a lot of your art as you go. Now, here's another example wireframe. I know this one is a little bit hard to see. 
but it's an example of a project I worked on, uh, I guess it was a year or two ago, called Mad Jeff's Music Lab, which is a popular iPhone, iPad, and Android uh, music app available on those app stores. And the gist of the app is that it presents a beat pad, um, which is uh, a three-by-three three matrix consisting of nine different sounds. So when the user presses one of those beat pad buttons, a specific sound comes out. It might be um, a drum tap. It might be uh, a cymbal. It, it might be some kind of a horn sound, uh, a cello tweak, or something like that. And then each bank on the right, uh, the bank buttons on the right, hold a different set of nine sounds. And when the user selects that, those new nine sounds are loaded into the beat pad. So um, the idea is that an aspiring musician can use this to create their own um, individual personal beat, uh, their own unique music, basically. And, um, and, and in doing so, they have 27 sounds at their fingertips. And the user can, can set the tempo for their beat using the metronome um, you see the metronome icon on the bottom control panel, uh, bottom control bar, and then the user will basically uh, record their beat and save it, and they can share it uh, off. But also, the app allows the user to record their voice over the beat, and then uh, you know once it's in final product, they can share it with their friends or share it to their friends using their social networks. And here's the net result of the product user interface has evolved from the user design studio wireframes. Now it took us a number of iterations and uh, prototypes to get it to look so clean and concise as this, but you can kind of compare, you know, where where we uh, came from, which is a, um, you know, a penciled in drawing on a large sheet of paper to the final uh, product user interface and get an idea of how that might evolve towards this. Okay, well, what are the benefits of this user design studio technique? The benefits mostly revolve around teamwork and collaboration, but I would say the most important benefit of this technique is that the product wins. Um, the user interfaces created using the user design studio technique tend to be much better than those created by a single individual or honestly, even a team of user interface experts. Um, so as you'll see in the actual technique, it's a crowd-based wisdom, um, diverse type approach that involves a lot of ideas, and then uh, you can mesh those good ideas together so that the product wins. Okay, enough of the setup. What exactly is the technique? Let's jump into that. Um, first is the announcement of the meeting. And in reality, anyone can call a user design studio meeting. Um, when I've seen it, it's typically called by the uh, scrum master or the product owner or perhaps even an agile manager. Now, I would advise that you invite six to eight people only. Um, because if you invite more than that, uh, it, it might take more than, more than a day. Um, most importantly in the invitation is to invite a variety of roles to ensure a broad-based perspective. For example, you might invite a couple of software developers on the team, um, you know, one or two QA folks. Uh, QA folks really uh, appreciate participating in this and uh, I would highly advise you to get their perspective also. Um, maybe you'll invite a product manager that has a, uh, you know, kind of a historical perspective on the, the product line and has a vision of where they, they want this product project to fit into their product line. Obviously, the product owner needs to be there, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Um, actually, uh, many times that I've used this technique, we have a person at, um, at the company that I'm currently engaged with, Worldlink in Frisco, Texas. Um, she is our lead marketing analyst, 
and she is excellent with user interface ideas and creative concepts. So we always invite Sarah into the user design studio sessions because oftentimes she she has the best ideas and can coalesce many of the other good ideas into meshed form. Um, if your customer is willing to participate in this activity, absolutely invite them and encourage them to do so. Um, and in doing that, it will help foster a feeling of ownership in terms of, well, I was part of the team that actually created or designed this user interface, and therefore, you know, I'm responsible for helping see it to completion and success. Mike, can we take one question while it is in the flow on the team? Are there, you put there are no real restrictions, but there are there some do's and don'ts on who should uh, make for a candidate? You said there should be only six to eight people, so which developer yeah. to invite? Should you invite a state executive stakeholder who may have interest in, mm -hmm. um, in being involved or not? So any guidance sure. on who should be invited? Well, there really is no guidance. The, the only one thing I would say is, uh, based on my experience, it helps to invite a diverse crowd. Um, so if, if you feel like an executive stakeholder that has shown a lot of interest in this product uh, could participate and really help out in this, then absolutely. Um, you might think, well, let me just invite the senior software Developers, I would I would say uh, not so fast on that. You know, you might find that some of your juniors or freshers actually have some new refreshing and creative ideas to add into this mix. Also, so the most important thing, Hemet, at this point is diversity. You want the broad-based spectrum of ideas because if you can get that and have some discussion around it. Guess what? The product wins. Right. So that makes sense. So that's uh, also a fundamental premise of the wisdom of crowds, which is yeah. the word crowd. Yeah. One follow up on that, Mike. So you, one thing to see in this list of people is a UX expert. So right. if, you, if a team happened to have a UI slash UX user interface expert, they should be there. They should be there. Yeah, they, they really should. It was not a conscious effort for me to exclude them in any way, shape, or form. Uh, those folks are extremely talented, and they know how to do research into usability and to work closely with the client and, and figure out the, the best and most appropriate user interface. And we definitely want their ideas. We want to uh, basically ratchet it up a notch, though, in terms of we don't just want their ideas. We want their ideas factored into everybody else's ideas because if we can do that, then the product wins. Yeah, great question. Hadn't thought about that, though. Okay, um, so we've made the announcement. And then, um, and then the day of the user design studio comes, and the first 30 minutes, really 30 to 45 minutes, whatever's appropriate, the product owner has the responsibility of presenting the vision of the project to the team that has assembled. So the product owner may want to do some uh, upfront research. They may want to print out some materials and hand those out. They may want to draw, a, I don't know, a flow chart or a sequence diagram of, of a major uh, user story involved just to kind of get everybody in the right context of what is about to be discussed. So the product owner has an important uh, responsibility here right off the bat is to kind of set the context for the meeting and this is what we're talking about, this is the vision the client has, this is what I know about it so far. Hey, take some questions from the attendees, uh, try your best to answer them, maybe even call the client right then and there and ask them to answer a question. So kind of context setting and, and kind of setting up the rest of the day for success. Okay, after that uh, introductory session of 30 to 45 minutes, uh, we'll go to step two in the AM session, and this generally takes about an hour and a half. So um, in this next step, every person in the room, the six to eight people, works individually, 
and they actually draw a user interface that in their opinion models the requirements as discussed uh, in the previous segment by the product owner. So everybody's working individually. Um, there's these big tablets of white paper. People can use pencils. There's colored markers, sometimes uh, you know, using different colors to highlight certain things can make a big difference. And uh, one very important note here is to uh, uh, be sure and draw big pictures because each person individually will be presenting. So as you present your artwork, uh, again referring back to the analogy of the art gallery showing, as you present your artwork, you want it uh, relatively easy to see so that it can uh, spark more conversation and discussion. I will take a couple of questions here. So, uh, first thing, is there an, a guideline that the team would have agreed earlier in the day, uh, beginning of the, the day itself, which is this interface design will have three screens, you know, a login screen and a navigator, or hmm. each contributor will determine their own number of screens? Yeah, it's, it's definitely more the latter. Each contributor, each contributor, each, each person drawing, their version of the user interface will just have to make their own decision as to how many screens and what levels of screens are appropriate. Now, as they present, you'll see some disparate ideas regarding that. And through team consensus, you just have to decide which which approach is more appropriate. And each of these contributors are then uh, using, as you suggested, a flip chart kind of a yes. large screen format? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Right. okay, let's continue on. Okay, step three, which is the final step in the AM session, is again about an hour and a half, and this is prior to lunch. Um, uh, so after the, the hour and a half where everybody is drawing their own individual user interface, then we go round robin, and each person presents their artwork. Um, each person stands up individually and presents their artwork to the attendees. So you'll have about 10 minutes each. Uh, you want to give a little time for some Q&A. And while the person is presenting, the audience is encouraged to give their feedback. If they really like an idea, they, they should state that. If they're not so sure about something, then, then they should state that. And what's going on in addition to this is that the, the meeting facilitator, which can be a volunteer or maybe it's the product owner or the scrum master, the facilitator is actually writing down and tracking the good ideas and the not so good ideas. So imagine one big white sheet with all the good ideas and one not so big white sheet with all the bad ideas. And, you know, maybe we don't call them bad ideas, uh, you know, because no idea is really bad, but maybe there are ideas that through discussion we all agree, eh, okay, we probably won't use that idea. Not a problem. People shouldn't take it personal. Uh, but we're going to write those down so that it, just in case they come back up uh, later during the day, will remember, oh yeah, we originally classified that as not such a good idea, so let's explore the reasons as to that. So there is a tracking uh, thing that's going on in this, and the facilitator ensures a positive experience overall. Okay, next up is very important, it's uh, lunch. Uh, so be sure and order in lunch. Um, and then I would always advise, you know, take a 20-minute break um, at lunchtime to let everyone go back and read their emails and kind of get caught up with what's transpired while they've been in the uh, user design studio all morning. But then ask them to come back in about 20 minutes and lunch will be served at, at that point. Um, you know, one observation I had during the lunchtime uh, period, and I'm not really sure why, but... Oftentimes, the best ideas come during lunch, and I'm not sure why that is, but I suspect it has something to do with, okay, people have digested a large amount of information, six to eight different ideas on the user interface. Um, I guess food kind of energizes your brain, and people are more relaxed uh, during lunch, and uh, 
and then they can uh, continue the discussion of, yeah, I thought uh, uh, Mary's idea, you know, on the, um, you know, navigation bar at the top was really good. If we could somehow combine that with Ralph's idea on the control buttons on the bottom, then that would be an awesome user interface and kick off some discussions like that. And again, you'll find uh, that a lot of really great ideas come out of a, um, a seemingly non-working lunch. I have another question on the mechanics of this uh, these sessions. So in the pre-lunch, when people, before they present it to the group, when they're working individually, right. are they working individually in a common team room kind yes. of environment, or are they going off to their offices yeah. and for coming back with their yeah. product? Honestly, I don't think it really matters, but the, the 30 or so that I've been involved in, we all stay in the common area. Uh, and it, it does kind of make sense because maybe you're sharing the, the colored markers and, oh, I ran out of paper, where do I get the, you know, the extra paper? So I would say keep it in the common environment. And plus, the questions may come up. Questions may come up that everyone will benefit from hearing the answer from the product owner or, as I said before, call up the client right then and there and ask them that question. So you need to have a large enough room to allow yeah. each conference room people to yeah. well conference room usually usually works fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, we finished lunch. We finished exploring some more ideas that were floated during lunch. Now let's move on into the p the PM session. Um, the first uh, part of the PM session is step one. It takes uh, three hours. So think of it as one PM to four PM. Um, you do need to announce that we do have a hard stop at 4 p.m. That helps the team get focused and to ensure that we have something ready to show at 4 p.m. So this is where we're going to uh, take all of the individual attempts at the user interface design, but this time everyone works on a new design together collaboratively. So. Use the list of all the good ideas. And yes, use the list of the not so good ideas. But as you're talking about the new user interface design, um, keep referring back to the good ideas list. And find those ideas that really mesh well together. Now, you will find that not all good ideas mesh well together. So unfortunately, some good ideas that just don't seem to mesh with the others, unfortunately, you'll have to park those. But I think you'll find that 60 or 70 percent of all the good ideas kind of mesh together, and without adding any indirection or non-intuitiveness, um, you can accomplish all of those things together in a very powerful user interface design. So if you have time, refine the design and repeat it. You'll find that you'll end up drawing each screen probably two or three times just to get it in a more presentable uh, form. The facilitator has another very important role in this step of the uh, day-long meeting. They have to ensure a positive experience and ensure that the people that are by nature more quiet uh, are participating uh, by perhaps asking them open-ended questions to engage them. So, you know, anytime you're in a collaborative setting, um, the conversation might be dominated by one or two uh, senior or subject matter experts. And the facilitator has to guard against that to ensure that everybody's ideas are being listened to and considered. Um, and at this point, you might be thinking, well, this is just BS, uh, as in brainstorming. Uh, it's just like we do today, right? But to that, I would respectfully disagree. Um, the big difference between user design studio and brainstorming is the individual work and the individual presentations up front that ensure everyone's ideas are considered and ensure that everyone is involved and that a broad spectrum of ideas are discussed. Again, you're going to get tired of me saying it, but the product wins. Um, we've all been in brainstorming sessions um, where, you know, 
a, a subject matter expert or a type A personality, whether they truly know anything about the topic or not, they basically drive the discussion and sometimes they don't really consider other options and opinions. Um, the great thing about the user design studio technique is it helps prevent that from occurring. So if you combine the upfront individual artwork presentations with a strong facilitator role of ensuring that everybody is involved, then the resultant user interface can be much better than done by a single person or even a, a, a previous uh, team of UX experts. And as I said before, the product wins. Okay, hard stop at 4 p.m. This is where previously whoever sent the announcement has invited in your internal company stakeholders. Now, if your client did not participate in the building of the user interface during the uh, design studio session, then absolutely invite them to this session. Man, this is your chance to show off what your team can do. So invite the client to attend this. Put all the caveats around it. Wow, this is a one-day effort. Um, it's preliminary, but we think we've got a good set of wireframes here that we can uh, mock up and prototype and start our Sprint One development in. Uh, Definitely take feedback from the audience and write down the actions that you get. Um, another idea is, um, and I've never really used this, but uh, I think on the next one I am, um, at the end of the, uh, P, the, the stakeholder management presentation, I'm going to ask the team to stick around for another 20 or 30 minutes. In the spirit of Agile, we're going to do a quick retrospective. Uh, discuss how the design studio session can get even better. Maybe we need a shorter lunch time. Or maybe the ideas uh, discovered during lunch means that the lunch needs to be an hour and a half or two hours now. Um, maybe uh, the individual presentations felt rushed. So we need 15 minutes per person instead of 10 minutes. Or maybe um, you know, there's a new idea for a way to track the good versus, the, you know, uh, not so good ideas. So having a, a short retrospective at the end of this to internally uh, inspect and adapt this technique, I think, would be highly advisable. Okay. Recent example from my uh, experience, as I said, I'm currently engaged uh, uh, from a long-term perspective at uh, a great company in Frisco, Texas called WorldLink. And our specialty is mobility solutions all the way from application development to back-end servers and integration with, with your existing systems. Um, so we did an iPad application uh, recently called My Personal Motivator. And it's not yet available on iTunes, but it will be soon. So I'm just quickly going to step through our screen, or our wireframes produced from our user design studio, and then show you a few of the uh, resultant product screen. Um, the gist of this app is that it presents the user with over 100 emotions or moods to choose from. And then uh, so the user basically selects how they're currently feeling. And based on that selection, the app serves up uh, 15 motivational quotes based on that selection. So if you've ever used a random quote generator, um, you know, of course I'm biased, but this app is so much better than random quote generators because while quotes received in a random quote generator are great quotes, they may or may not resonate with you at that time depending on how you're feeling. For example, if you're feeling worried, you don't necessarily want to see, receive a, a quote about, um, you know, something, uh, an unrelated topic. So um, this app also presents beautiful background pictures. Um, the user can mark a quote as a favorite and then view the favorites. The user can also enter their own quote because 15 quotes times 100 emotions, you know, the 1,500 quotes built into the app, that it's not going to cover all of the uh, motivational quotes that the user may like. 
Uh, the user can also share the quotes to Facebook, email. I think we also support SMS texting, at least from the iPhone app perspective, we do. And then there's a slideshow mode to see all the quotes for a selected category on a timed basis. So with that, uh, let me show you some of the uh, original hand-drawn wireframes we came up with out of our user design studio session for this project. Um, you'll see at the upper, in, on the left picture, the upper left portion of that, that's meant to indicate a smartphone or actually in this case, it's the iPad. The iPad has a number of icons where when the user touches one of those, it actually launches the app and we're, we're going to show a My Personal Motivator splash screen for about five seconds before the app goes into its main, uh, its main screen. So on the bottom of the left-hand uh, picture is the, uh, is the main screen. You'll see an area for the categories on the left side. Those are the emotions or moods that I was uh, speaking to. It's a scrollable list with a ruler, an A to Z type ruler there. Um, you'll also see a navigation bar at the top which has buttons for motivator, favorites, and my quotes. Um, then the largest portion of the iPad screen is dedicated to the quote. You'll see the quote area with uh, uh, the, you know, the quote and then the uh, author name and, and a small blurb about the author to help put the quote in context. A control bar at the bottom is used to advance the quotes left and right. So as the quotes advance and get to 15, it wraps back to one, and vice versa, if you're advancing backwards, it wraps from one to 15. Now we also support the classic uh, smartphone swipe uh, way to traverse through the quotes, uh, but we have found in, in our user studies that users tend to appreciate uh, a big button to advance there also. Uh, also on the control bar is a favorite uh, star. If you like the quote, you can simply uh, select that star and it will change colors indicating that it's now in your favorites list. Uh, there's another button there for sharing to your social networks. And then finally the button in the middle there on the control bar is the uh, slideshow button. So on the right hand side picture is, uh, is, is the uh, screen uh, is the wireframes we develop to cover off the uh, the slideshow settings. You know, when you select that slideshow um, button, you can set your uh, slideshow transition to be dissolved, left to right fly-in, and whatever else is supported on the iOS operating system. You can set the speed perhaps from 10 seconds to 30 seconds uh, so that, again, you can just select a single category and say slideshow, uh, 20 seconds, and then uh, uh, the first quote will be shown, giving you ample time to read it. 20 seconds later, the second quote will be shown on and on and on to the very end. And then on the bottom of the, uh, the right-hand picture is the, uh, the My Quote screen, where the user is allowed to type in another quote that is not provided within the app, and they can save that and then uh, traverse through their own quotes. So here's a final uh, product view of it. I'll show you a couple of slides of this. Uh, you'll see the main screen on the left. Um, we have the, the navigation bar. You'll notice we added in a fourth button called About, which basically just gives a little information about, uh, about the app and the developer. So you'll see the main buttons for Motivator mode, Favorites mode, and My Quotes mode. Uh, you'll see the category list, it's scrollable form with all of our moods built in there, and then the, um, uh, the, uh, the ruler on the right-hand side of the category list there. We also added this question at the top, how are you feeling today? Just to kind of prompt the user, oh, I'm feeling angry, or I'm feeling creative, I'm feeling frustrated. You know, and then select that, and then boom, there's your 15 uh, quotes associated with that mood. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see an example of uh, we've, we even have subcategories built into it. Um, one classic example is needing, and then some of the subcategories under needing are change of scenery, purpose in life, uh, uh, inspiration, motivation, things like that. 
Okay. Um, here's another slide showing some uh, some of the end results, the product screens. Uh, this is the favorites screen on the far left there, and um, the the good thing about favorites is, is it's the same user mental model, the same UI mental model as the motivator mode. The only difference is it's a subset of quotes that the user has marked as favorites. And then the category list on the left side there only shows those categories in which the favorite quote has been selected. But again, the control bar at the bottom works exactly the same. The traversal left and right, wrapping, how you select the category, all of that is the exact same mental model used uh, in the motivator mode also. On the right hand side is the, uh, this is how if you select the share button, this is how you share a quote to email or Facebook, just ignore the log out option there, that was a temporary thing that we put in there. And then finally, uh, one more slide of this. Um, on the left hand side there, that's the uh, the my quotes, uh, basically how you add your own quote. And, and then on the right hand side, uh, how you view your own quotes after they have already been added. So you'll see this quote that was added, uh, the great use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. And then the author name is William James, an American philosopher. And then, once again, in the My Quotes mode, the same mental model for user interface as in Favorites and as in Motivator. So once they learn how to traverse the quotes and how to share them and flag them as Favorites, it's all the same model regardless of what mode they're in. Whoops, sorry, we have one more slide on the uh, results of the product. Uh, the leftmost picture shows you how to set the options for the slideshow consisting of both transition type and speed and then uh, the slideshow begins and you read the quotes while it auto advances. Most of the quotes are fairly short so you can read them and read the author within 10 to 15 seconds. And then on the right is what I was talking about earlier, the about screen brings up some information about the developer and kind of a preview version of some of our previous apps. Okay, well let's wrap up. In conclusion, uh, the user design studio technique is becoming more and more popular. The thing, the thing that I really like about it is it emphasizes many of the agile concepts such as emergent design, uh, crowd-based wisdom, design just enough to get going. Um, it emphasizes all of that so it fits right into your agile suite of techniques and tools and methods. I've used it personally on more than 30 different projects and I can certainly attest that it works. And I would strongly encourage you to give it a try on your next project. Now, um, I showed you an example from the mobile app world, an iPad app, but I've seen this technique used in in brand new websites. I've seen it used in enterprise systems from a medical workflow perspective and uh, insurance system. So there's really no restrictions on the type of user interface that you could use this technique on. And just to wrap up on my side, uh, quick commercial about Three Beacons there. Um, we are a leader in Agile Methods training and coaching and we can deliver any of these types of courses to your on-site location. And regarding uh, seminars and workshops, I actually have a three-hour hands-on workshop of the user design studio technique that I can deliver to your company also. And in the past, we've gotten great feedback on it, and you actually get to experience this technique firsthand, and I can certainly facilitate that um, to your company to help ensure that your organization learns this approach. Alternately, if you'd like me to attend your first user design studio and be the facilitator and help ensure that that goes well, I can certainly do that. Now with that, uh, I'd like to thank the audience very much and I'm gonna turn it back over to Hammond. Thank you, Mike, for this excellent coverage. We have a number of questions here as usual, yes? but before I get to questions, so now this is a note to the audience, uh, you guys, uh, gone through this and, and some of you have 
already posed some questions, but I suggest to give some thought to what Mike just covered. And if you have any other questions about how to go about the technique, keep adding your questions in your Q&A panel. And I'll come to questions in just a minute. While you're doing the thought process around your questions, I want to do an intro to a sinner's um, uh, for those who have not uh, uh, been part of our uh, ecosystem here. So Synergy, in a nutshell, essentially I'll make a few points about Synergy as a company. We are a software product development partner for typically small to mid-sized technology companies. We typically work with venture-backed companies in the growth phase and help them with the entire software development lifecycle uh, from uh, soup to nuts of building the software. And the second uh, point uh, about Synergy is the team that we put together for our clients. For each client, we have, would have a dedicated team uh, on which serves almost as an extension of the in-house team. And uh, this continues to work seamlessly. Uh, you may have your you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 person in-house team, and then our team will seamlessly add to your team a stable team and um, uh, working as one common team for you for the client. And the, the value with that team is to, to the table for the clients is not just you know, arms and legs for doing the software development and testing work, but actually, bringing the software expertise that we bring, uh, which is agile development techniques, and really reducing the risk of software development delivery for our clients. We've given our experience level and the focus on agile techniques, which as you are pretty familiar with now, allow you to be responsive to the market, yet follow a certain uh, discipline and rigor of software development uh, through the process. The next uh, value proposition that we bring to the table for our clients Actually, the cost economics argument. We have a built-in operation with a team in India, uh, and it's a small team on the U.S. side in Austin, uh, Dallas, and San Francisco. And we are able to provide a dual show team with that a 50% cost advantage for building uh, if we do apples to apples comparison of the uh, of the development cost. And the last point in, in our offering is the flexibility. We are able to provide you flexibility not only in terms of uh, team ramp up and ramp down, but also at certain points in the life of a, of a client, they want to take the team over and convert it to their own in-house captive operations. We are able to uh, make that happen in a collaborative uh, teamwork with our clients, uh, so we become a true long-term partner for our client. The next page, uh, as it refreshes on your screens in a, in, a, in a few seconds, is essentially a kind of a representative list of some of our clients that uh, you'll see. Most of our clients are small to mid-sized technology companies with a strong bias towards Austin, Dallas, Houston uh, ecosystem, but also we have clients in San Francisco, Bay Area, as well as uh, Chicago and, uh, and the East Coast. So that's as much about our clients. Now let's kind of turn our attention over to the questions. Like, uh, so we have a number of questions, and, and I will start taking the question, but in no particular order. Okay. okay. So the first question here is, um, uh, when do you do this exercise? Is it done oh. at the beginning, very beginning of the session prior to the, yeah. uh, every sprint, or do you do it one time per release cycle, or do you do it uh, you know, every sprint? What's the frequency and to do it? Yeah, actually, uh, most it's mostly a, an activity that you do near the start of the project. So uh, there are a couple of prerequisites, for example, um, the product owner, when they come in, the, the first 30 minutes of the user design studio is they're presenting the project vision. So uh, there has to be at least some level of understanding of the project vision before you could do this technique. Um, generally, the way I've seen it is it's done one, it's done once up front um, to get kind of a broad view of all of the uh, screens that, that might be required. Um, uh, although I have not seen it uh, be, uh, you know, be called again during a project, perhaps at the end of each release, I could see a situation where, um, you know, you have some new requirements from the client and uh, you need to hold a smaller version of the user design studio just to, uh, kind of a wireframe up the new screens associated with those new requirements. So certainly you can hold this uh, meeting at any time that makes sense during the project, 
but for the most part, think of it as an upfront uh, discussion. Okay. Let's take the next question, which I'm going to combine a couple of questions on this topic. Uh, and, and so the nature of the question is, um, do you really need some level of um, UI design expertise in the room to guide the team that is going through this exercise? So do you need at least one of the team members to be a UI design person and or is there a sharing of best practices of UI design that has to be uh, shared across the room before the team starts launching off getting their versions? So any thought of that? Well, this is, um, I don't really think uh, everyone needs to be knowledgeable about that. And um, obviously, if a UX person is in there, they're going to have these best practices at the ready. And when, when it comes time to do the collaborative portion of this activity, they're going to be very vocal in terms of, now, you wouldn't necessarily place that button there because uh, a more accepted, better design practice is to do it this way. And people will listen and more often than not will, will, will agree with, with their opinion. So um, at least in my experience, the way I've seen it work is uh, uh, people don't have to have that upfront knowledge of, of best design practices coming into it. Uh, as long as somebody participates that has that knowledge, um, you know, that, that is sufficient for getting that out. Remember, the focus here is a set of wireframes. It's not intended to be the final product. So uh, that's what, you know, the, the UX experts uh, will certainly uh, uh, weigh in their opinion throughout the whole course of the project to get it to adhere to the common and uh, best practices of usability. Okay. Let's take a related follow-up question on this thought itself, which is short of having a UI or UX expert in the room to guide the brain, is there any resource like a, a white paper or, or a book mm -hmm. or something that you can refer oh. the audience towards the best practices in UI design uh, so that team can get up to speed on the fundamentals? Yes. Uh, the, the, the name of the book escapes me right now, but it's written by Jeff Patton. Okay. Um, and, um, boy, the name of it escapes me, but basically anything from Jeff Patton, P-A-T-T-O-N. He's a very famous agilist uh, who specializes in uh, uh, user stories, user story mapping, uh, usability aspects, things like that. Um, so, but I would, I would venture a guess that there are many books on um, uh, good UI practices. Um, so I've read several, uh, but they're a little bit dated, so I don't want to. But would you make that as a sort of pre-reading requirement? For See, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, uh, for a QA person to be invited to a meeting and, oh, well, you really can't participate until you've read these books. And, and since that is not a, an area of interest for them or a selected career path, chances are They've never read a book on on uh, usability, so uh, you know having that as a prerequisite doesn't strike me as something that that should be done. Hey, you know it's a uh, it's kind of a greenfield, uh, fun, collaborative type session, and we're going to know each other's backgrounds and we'll understand the context of you saying something. And yes, the UX, if there is as somebody who's experienced in user interfaces there, they may be a little more vocal than the others about positional placement and intuitiveness. And that's good. That's really good. But uh, we should not uh, necessarily expect that from the other participants. Another question um, uh, in this case is, is this process also a good uh, mechanism for um, redesigning a UI? Let's say you have an existing product, it's working, you have installed base of customers, but you've for some reason, you need to go through it. Yep. You might redesign for it. Yeah, that, that that is an excellent question. Now, I don't know who asked it, but please send me an email. But uh, that it, the answer to that is absolutely yes. And I've seen it happen twice in my career. We um, we uh, we we took over the development of of an app for, for from a previous uh, vendor, and. Uh, you know, came to the conclusion, I guess, like most software engineers do, that it's better if we rewrite it. And, and so part of that was redesigning the user interface. So we kind of started from scratch. And scratch means 
blank white sheets of paper and then came up with a much better user interface. And for those who've been around the software block, complete redesign <laughs> of software and, and complete redesign of user interfaces part for the course. Yes. Uh, yes. The normal process after you've had some experience. We, we, we somehow claim that that's cheaper than just modifying the existing, right? <laughs> okay, another question on this technique is, um, how does this work in a distributed team? Is there a version of it that can be effectively applied if you don't have all people, everybody in the room? Well, it can. Uh, I'll be honest, I've, I've never tried it in distributed form, but uh, if you do have a distributed team, it's definitely a good idea to invite them. You might have to ask them to shift their hours to work, uh, you know, kind of a, the, the night shift on that one day, but definitely through Skype, and, and you know, the most important thing here is uh, is body language, so uh, having, uh, you know, Skype video going uh, where, okay, uh, person in India or China, it's your turn to do your individual presentation, then absolutely, they back up from the camera, and they step, step the audience through uh, via video what their artwork is, and then they take feedback, and the facilitator is listening, and they're jotting down the good ideas and not so good ideas. So I don't see why it could not work even in distributed form. Excellent. Let's take another question, um, uh, continuing the thread from one of the earlier questions. Uh, how much pre-work is required for the audience? So let's say you picked your six to eight people, two developer, two QA representatives, and so on, and your team to, to come to the room on this 9 o'clock to, to kick right. off this user design studio. The day before or the week before, do they have to say building, let's say, in a certain domain, an application, yeah. let's say the domain is something relatively esoteric, let's say oil and gas seismic mm -hmm. analysis kind of domain. For such unique kind of areas, is there pre-reading required so that everybody walking in the room has a better context, understanding of the end user before they launch off in, in their yeah. user design? Uh, I think that's a great question and does come up from time to time. And I'll start the discussion or the answer like this. If, if the context of the project is relatively familiar with the team, there is very little, if no, pre-work required. Uh, the product owner has to do some things in terms of deciding how they're going to present the project vision, maybe print some handouts, maybe draw up a, a, a flow or, or whatever. Um, so if, if the area or domain that this project exists in is familiar to the team, there's next to no pre-work other than what the product owner has to do. And that's a good thing. Um, now, if this is a new domain area for the team, it's always a good idea when the person sends out that announcement to give some uh, websites that people can read through and browse through just to get a better understanding of this new domain for oil and gas um, or uh, a new domain for uh, you know uh, uh, pressure water drilling or, or, or something like that so um, it's always better to have at least a high level understanding of the domain before you get into a user interface discussion about it. Now, you definitely don't want to spend days on end doing all kinds of research into that area just to go into a user design studio. Um, but, um, you know, browsing around on some websites, hey, here's a white paper which kind of explains the field that our client is in. You know, so the, the announcer of the meeting can do certain things to help ensure that the team, the invited team, has a better context coming into that. And if they will do that, then guess what? The meeting will go smoother and the product will win. Okay. Well, there are a few more questions, but let me take one quick one which is related to this uh, thing already, which is are there certain classes of application, mobile versus uh, desktop oh. or domain, uh, you know, detailed domain, oil and gas versus right. Right. better suited for this? Great, thing. great question. And and actually that's why I, you know, mentioned, yes, my example here is in the mobile app arena. But please do not, do not make the mistake of thinking this is only a technique for application or mobile app type development. No. I have actually seen it with, with many of my other clients 
in the areas of uh, medical workflow systems, uh, internal insurance um, uh, tracking systems. Um, so the uh, website, brand new website development. So all of this, again, this type of technique uh, can be used for really any kind of system that has a user interface. Now, uh, there may be some embedded systems that all they need is a very primitive in interface in manufacturing or something like that. Maybe you don't want to do that for this, for, for that type of environment. But anything that has, uh, you know, that, that needs intuitiveness, that can benefit from the wisdom of the crowd, that has a number of relatively complex features, that's probably deserving of a technique like this. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mike. We have run into the, uh, the time limit here, so I'm going to have to pause here. But to, to all of you attended, thank you so much for joining us today. This is a, this is a very powerful topic, very conducive to enhance software development and wisdom of crowds. Uh, so do ping us if there's something we can do to help you think through this, or if you need Mike to be involved in your facilitation of a user design studio. And uh, we'll meet again next uh, month for another webinar on the Agile topics. Thank you.